Welcome Anatomy 41 students to workshop one. We'll talk about transport mechanisms in this workshop. By the end of this activity, you should be able to understand the process of each transport mechanism, understand the energy requirements and concentration gradient types of each transport mechanism, describe the sol three solution types in regard to osmosis, and then explain the similarities and differences among passive and active transport processes. So we first need to talk about what a concentration gradient is. And this is the difference between concentrations of two areas. So for example, there will be more of a substance on one side of a plasma membrane uh, than the other. And if there are equal concentrations between the two areas, then no concentration gradient exists. So if we look at this um, drawing of the um, plasma membrane on the lower right hand of the screen, we see there are more hydrogen ions on the exterior of the cell than on the interior of the cell. So there's a greater concentration of hydrogen ions above the phospholipid bilayer than below. So this would mean a concentration gradient exists because there's a higher concentration of hydrogen ions above than below. This is showing a hydrogen ion being actively transported into an area of greater concentration, and that will require energy or ATP. If this hydrogen ion was going in the opposite direction, that would not require energy because it's going from an area of high to low concentration. Simple diffusion. Um, diffusion is any molecule moving through a membrane or dispersing in a medium by its own energy. So this will happen passively. Um, this molecule will move from an area where it's highly concentrated to an area of low concentration. So this happens automatically. We'll talk about a few examples of this. One example is um, spraying a little bit of perfume in the air. Eventually that perfume, those um, molecules would disperse by simple diffusion to the rest of the room so everyone in the room could smell it. So that's simple diffusion. Any molecule moving through a membrane or dispersing in a medium by its own energy, moving from an area of high concentration where you first spray the perfume to an area of low concentration. Diffusion activity, another example that we could do is look at a um, solvent of water molecules. And if we place some dye molecules in it, so let's put, say this is food coloring or food dye or anything else, um, what will happen to the dye molecules? How will they spread out? They are first extremely concentrated, so this is an area of high concentration. And what do you think will happen over time to these dye molecules or this solute? So we'll start by placing the dye into the water. So this is the area of high concentration. And due to simple diffusion, the water and dye molecules will spread out by their own energy, and they'll get completely mixed up until there's an equal distribution of molecules results. So this is a diffusion example moving from an area of high concentration where that dye is placed in the water to an area of low concentration or equal concentration where everything was equally distributed. So a concentration gradient exists in the first picture, but in letter C, no concentration gradient exists anymore because there's an equal concentration of solute molecules throughout the solution. Gases undergo diffusion as well, oxygen and carbon dioxide. A great example of this is what happens in your lungs, and you'll cover this when you talk about the respiratory system. But we have little um, sacs of air in your lungs called an alveolus or an alveoli, and capillaries will surround the sacs, and oxygen will diffuse from the air you breathe, and the alveolus diffuse directly into these blood capillaries. And the capillaries will take this um, oxygenated blood back to the heart, and the heart then will pump that oxygenated blood out of the body. So this is simple diffusion. There's an area of higher concentration inside the alveolus, where you just breathed in all this oxygen. So there's a lot of oxygen in the alveolus, high concentration, and it will diffuse passively into the capillary, going from an area of highly concentrated oxygen to low concentrated of oxygen um, into the blood capillaries. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. So water molecules moving through a membrane 
or dispersing in a medium is known as osmosis. So again, this happens passively by its own energy. The water travels from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So water will always move from where there's more water to where there is less water. And this is osmosis. Simply put, it's just the diffusion of water molecules. There's one simple rule, and I like this rule. I use it when I teach uh, solutes suck the water. So this just means that water will always move into an area where there's a greater solute concentration. So again, osmosis, water is moving from an area of high water concentration to low water concentration. And the area of low water concentration will be where there are more solutes in the solution. So solutes suck the water in the direction that it will go. So if you can remember solutes suck, hopefully that will help. Selectively permeable or a semi-permeable membrane is involved in osmosis. And a selectively permeable means that not everything can get through the membrane. So if this blue, um, these blue rectangles are considered the membrane, this membrane is considered selectively permeable because not every molecule will be able to fit through or get through the membrane. You can see the red molecules are able to squeeze through the spaces, but the pink circles are too big. So this is selectively permeable only to the red circles. So what does this have to do with water? So if we set up a U-shaped beaker as shown here with a selectively permeable membrane in the middle um, of the two solutions, this selectively permeable membrane is only permeable to water. So in the purple circles are too big to fit through the selectively permeable membrane. If we start with a two solutions on either side, one having a more concentrated solution, so there's less water on the right side of the speaker, we call this a hypertonic solution because it's more highly concentrated with more solute particles, so it's hypertonic. There's less water in it because the solutes are taking up more of the space. On the left side of the selectively permeable membrane is a hypotonic solution. Hypo means less, so there's less solute on the left side of this membrane, and that is shown by the less, or the, um, the lower number of purple circles. So there's less solute on the left side of the membrane. So if we put these two solutions in this U-shaped beaker with a selectively permeable membrane in between, what will happen over time? Which way will water osmos or move? And I know they give you the arrow, but let's just think through what happens. In order to eventually get equal concentration of solutions on both sides, we will have to look at the osmosis of water. So again, the membrane is permeable to water, and water always osmoses or diffuses from an area of high water concentration to low water concentration. And another way to think about it is that the solutes, the more solute or the hypertonic solution will suck water into it. When that happens, when water moves from the left side of the beaker to the right side of the beaker, we add water to the right side of the beaker. And water will move until two sides of the beaker are in equal concentration, so volume per space. So now on the right side, we see a U-shaped beaker. The water level on the left has lowered because more water moved over to the right side of the beaker to equal out concentrations. And now you can see how the solute particles are more evenly dispersed in the volume of water that's been given to them. So that is osmosis, the diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane from an area of high water concentration to low or lesser water concentration. And water will always move into an area where there's more solutes to try to disperse them to get two equal concentrations on both sides of the membrane. Um, so for osmosis playtime, we should define the molecule. You should always define molecules. So which ones are too big to get through the membrane? We know that the membrane only will allow water to go through and that's selectively permeable. And in this example, which direction will osmosis occur? So only water will move in this example. Water are the blue circles 
and the um, yellow circles are the solute. So water, again, moves from an area of high water concentration to low water concentration. The solutes suck the water onto their side, so our arrow should travel in that direction. So water will travel through that selectively permeable membrane to the right. So you guys can pause the video at this time to answer some of those osmosis questions on your packet, and then we'll come back together and go through them together. Okay, so what is an isotonic solution? Um, an iso, that prefix means the same, and this is where the solute concentration is equal inside of the cell and outside of the cell. So let's say we place a red blood cell. So this is a red blood cell in a normal isotonic solution. And the solution always refers to what we place the cell in. So the exterior of the cell is a 10% salt isotonic solution because the interior of the cell is also at 10% salt or 10% solute. So water will move in both directions, um, but it won't move more in one direction than the other because it's an isotonic solution. The water doesn't have to move in more in, in one direction more than another because everything, the concentrations are equal on both sides of the cell. So this is good for your um, red blood cells in your body to always have an isotonic solution so that your red blood cells aren't gaining water or losing water more than they should. What is a hypotonic solution? And again, a hypotonic solution always refers to the solution outside of what a cell would be placed in. So we're looking at a beaker and we're looking at the outside of the cell. What is this solution? The prefix hypo means less. So this means the con solute concentration is lower outside the cell. And if we put a cell in a hypotonic solution, so for example, the solution here is 10% salt on the exterior and 20% salt inside the cell, knowing what we know about osmosis, which way will water move? We know that water always moves into, into an area of greater solute concentration. So we know that water will move into the cell to try to um, equal the concentrations on both sides of the cell. When we place a cell into an ice in a hypotonic solution and water osmoses into the cell, the cell will fill up with too much water and it will expand. When this happens in the body, um, bad things can result. When too much water goes into your red blood cells, uh, they can start to expand and eventually cytolysis can result, which cytolysis literally means cell splitting. So the cell could burst and split apart, which is not good for your red blood cells. It would completely destroy them, um, meaning you would not have a way to transport oxygen to your uh, body systems and cells. So this is a hypotonic solution. Then in comparison to that, we have a hypertonic solution. In a hypertonic solution, the prefix hyper means more, and this is where the solute concentration is higher outside the cell than inside of the cell. So if we place a cell into a hypertonic solution, let's say there's 20% salt concentration outside the cell, 10% inside the cell, water again moves to an area of greater solute concentration where there's less water, so water will leave the cell and the cell will shrink. And that can be seen here on the right side of the picture. If you place one of your red blood cells into a hypertonic solution, the water will leave the cell, the cell will shrink. And we call that crenation when the, sh when the cell shrivels up or shrinks. So also not good for your red blood cells to be, in, be put in a hypertonic solution. So this is, um, you'll answer, some application questions and you'll go over the application questions in a live Zoom setting. So be sure to log on to Zoom at one of those times that fits with your schedule. Um, you'll do an activity and you'll also have a chance to answer and ask questions about the application packet that you're filling in to be submitted. Uh, this is just an example of what happens to fish. So I think one of your application questions is asking about saltwater and freshwater fish. And again, feel free to pause the screen here as you're filling that out. If we put a freshwater fish in an area of high salt content, water will flow out of the fish 
and it will not be good for the fish. And if we put a saltwater fish into fresh water, water will flow into the fish. So the fish, depending on what, if it's a saltwater, freshwater fish, need to be in the correct um, water content of salt, the same way our cells do. We're gonna finish um, this lecture by looking a little bit about how things get through the membrane. Um, if you can see here, this is a plasma membrane of a cell, and here it's the phospholipid bilayer with some carrier proteins. Non-charged molecules in water can easily get through the membrane, but macromolecules, things that are too big, and charged molecules and ions might need some help to get through the membrane. And this is where we come to facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion are small molecules. Um, it's the diffusion with the help of a carrier protein through a membrane. So it usually helps small molecules that are not lipid soluble. Mole molecules will still follow the concentration gradient and energy is not required, but because they're not lipid soluble, that means they cannot get through that phospholipid bilayer of the membrane. We have some sort of carrier protein to help them get across. And we have a quick video that we'll watch together about facilitated diffusion. In the process known as facilitated diffusion, a special carrier protein with a central channel acts as a selective corridor which helps molecules move across the membrane. These special carrier molecules that form the protein channel bind only to a specific molecule, such as a particular sugar or amino acid. Once the molecule binds to the carrier protein, this protein helps or facilitates the diffusion process by changing shape and moving the molecule down its concentration gradient through the membrane into the cell where it is released. Facilitated diffusion is similar to simple diffusion in that both involve movement of molecules down their concentration gradient, and this movement is carried out without any input of energy. However, in facilitated diffusion, the movement of molecules will only take place if it is facilitated or helped by a special protein carrier in the membrane. Facilitated diffusion can occur in either direction depending on the concentration gradient. If there is a higher concentration of the particular molecule inside the cell, the same carrier protein would then transport the molecules out of the cell. In the okay, so we'll go back to the PowerPoint. So that's facilitated diffusion. We'll, take, we'll go back to the PowerPoint here. Um, so, so facilitated diffusion was another passive transport process. Well, what does active transport mean? Um, active transport means that molecules will combine with carrier proteins and they, energy will be required for any sort of active transport process. Energy is in the form always of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and molecules will move against the concentration gradient in any sort of active transport. This will involve entering or leaving the cell. Energy will be required. An example here is a proton pump and we'll talk about other examples of active transport. So again, this is showing the proton pump, how ATP energy is required to move hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient. So moving from an area of low concentration to high concentration. Vesicle formation, uh, the transport of macromolecules into a contained vehicle, since they're too large for protein carriers, this is what vesicle formation is. This is, a, this is an example of active transport, so it does require energy. And we have exocytosis, which is exiting out of the cell in a vesicle, and endocytosis is entering into the cell via a vesicle. Exocytosis, again, exo means outside. You can see here um, the secretory vesicle has been formed around the substances that are too large. Um, to exit out of the cell in a different way. So a vesicle forms, and again, this is just a vehicle that will help deliver what's inside to the outside. Here's the plasma membrane. You can see how it fuses with the plasma membrane. And then the what's inside of the cell gets kind of spit out or let go to the exterior of the cell. So this is exocytosis, a form of active transport to help macromolecules or things too large to use a carrier protein to get out of the cell. 
endocytosis, endo means within, so this is active transport trying to get a large macromolecule inside the cell. Um, we have two types of endocytosis, phagocytosis and pinocytosis. Uh, phagocytosis means cell eating and pinocytosis means cell drinking. So phagocytosis will kind of engulf a large um, substance or particle that's extremely large inside the cell. So moving very large particles that are solid into the cell. And pinocytosis is moving liquid or a package of several smaller part particles inside of the cell. And you can see here how the membrane still kind of closes or forms a vesicle around what's being transported within the cell. And that's the end of this workshop. Thanks for listening, guys. Again, we hope to see you in a live Zoom session soon.